This week's episode is sponsored by White's Beaconsfield. White's Beaconsfield is the number one company in the UK to brighten up your smile at a very affordable price. Get your perfect smile today using code AGJAMESENGLISH at checkout for a 15% discount on all products. from White's Beckinsfield. I'm on day five out of seven and my teeth are looking white. So it doesn't contain peroxide, so it's very, very safe for you to use on your teeth. It doesn't cause any sensitivity and I've literally got the most sensitive teeth. The most affordable product, works like a dream. Look how white, with no filter, no sensitivity, and it is just one of the best that I've ever used. Right, that's three days, it's crazy. First time, uh, police burst through my house, six o'clock in the morning. I was in bed with my partner. I was about 17 years old, because I was a young dad. I was a dad at 16. I was about 17 years old. He said, we've just seen you driving a Nick car. You're under arrest. What are you fucking talking about? I'm in bed. No, we've just chased you. You've just come. And you know, it's nothing to do with me. Nick me, charged me. Was I convicted? Of course I fucking was. And this was at the time when the, uh, a lot of the European football matches were on and whatever else, and it was a smuggler's fucking paradise. The people I work with had the best routes. What customs officer wants, there's 10 coaches of English fans coming through at the pool, what, what customs officer wants to get a load of pissed up English fans off on the dock and start searching them? It's gonna get them fuckers through. I would have met the Dutch a few days before, I'd be plotted in an hotel, I'll meet them at the match, give them the bags that go on the coast, you just sling them on. But I eventually got caught and got 10 years for people smuggling. What they done is they duped me and said, we need to uh, take you to hospital to make sure you're fit to be questioned. And they drove me over into the English control zone. They charged you? They said, you're now under arrest. Drove me back Did to England. Did they have a warrant for that? Nope, it was totally illegal. Every move they fucking done was illegal. Technically, I was kidnapped by British mm -hmm. Customs and brought back to the UK because of the, the people smuggling at the time was such a big thing and they didn't want it to be... Uh, a new trend. A new, exactly. I'd actually took someone hostage, one of my mates, for some unknown reason. I was out of my nut, I took him hostage. Armed police stormed the flat to get him out. They were going to shoot me. They told me that afterwards. I, I worked out a plan. I thought, the only way I'm going to get out is I need to make some sort of weapon that's intimidating enough. And at the time, I thought, right, I'll get a pen. So I got a big pen, a paper clip, and I filled it up with black currant jam. And I took the prison officer hostage in the courtroom and said, if I don't open the doors, I'm going to inject him. So they opened all the doors. So. At the time, they opened the doors and let me go. When I eventually got arrested three months later, I was done for 23 false imprisonments, including the fucking judge. Ben, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Let's London's go. Ray Bishop. How are James, you, brother? Lovely to meet you at last. Yeah, eventually, mate. You. Yeah, you've read a, you've led a very interesting life, brother. Uh, yeah, somewhat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, your book, what we'll touch on, Outlaw. You've just gave me it, so I will get reading it, brother. <laughs> um, you like the pictures? Yeah, I saw. Yeah, probably, <laughs> mate. I struggle to read, mate. Um, <laughs> but you've led a very interesting life from being Britain's one of Britain's most wanted men. You've nearly spent over twenty years in prison. Armed robberies, drugs, people trafficking. You've done it all. You've yeah. done it all. Drug addiction. Yeah. But 
the beauty of life, brother, you changed. Most definitely, you know. I'm a great reformist. I think, now when my, when my autobiography came out and I wrote it for Virgin, it was Noel Razor Smith, very good friend of mine, fantastic author, as you know. He asked me to write it because he knew my story, he knew my tale. You know, I'd spent a lot of time with Razor when he was doing 25 years in the early 90s. I was locked up with him in I down and uh, I passed crossed again. He said, you've got to write your book. You've got a fascinating tale. Mm. It's almost unbelievable. So I wrote it. Uh, Razor took it. He gave it to a publisher that he knew. Uh, the publishing company read it and said, this has to go to a major publisher. Mm. I was like, wow. You know, it's just my story. Mm -hmm. uh, it went to Virgin, and Virgin said, we're going to release this, yeah. you know, and I was fucking blown away. The most wanted bit, mm -hmm. bit sensationalised, that was Virgin to mm -hmm. sell books. Obviously, I was for a period, you know, after I, I, I had escaped from uh, prison, whatever else, but uh, I don't know if I really like that so much because I'm a great reformist. It yeah. makes you sound a bit like Raoul Moat or the Yorkshire fucking yeah. Ripper, <laughs> which <laughs> yeah, I am. No, yeah, yeah, you know I get I mean? it. But so. like I say, those kind of stuff sells and it at, does. at a point you were, yeah. so it is true. Yeah. You're good friends with Noel Razor Smith, great man. Fantastic. Another reformed character. He's doing amazing in life. Got a lot of love for Noel. An Terry Ellis as well, who's on the show. Another again. inspiration. Um, Billy Moore, who's became a good friend, who's another also been on. Another friend Billy. of mine. He's became yeah. a very good friend, man, over the last and year. Billy's lived it. You know, yeah. I, know I know Bill. Me yeah. and Bill go way back. Mm -hmm. You know, Bill comes from the same school as me. Yeah. You know, our paths have crossed on yeah. numerous occasions. You know, he's a fighting man, mm -hmm. like I was myself. You know, he's a, he's a good man, Billy. Oh, Billy as, as is Terry, yeah. as is Oh, Noel. yeah, them all. Billy, um, prayer before dawn, but shout out because congratulations as well. His message just had a son. Yeah, um, fantastic, Billy. Billy. Yeah, so and fantastic, Billy, for you know, beating yeah. cancer. Cancer yeah. won't beat you, my old mate. Yeah, nah, he's too strong. He's been through too much he, shit. Yes, and he's yes. working on a second book, man. So, again, mate, it's all fucking crazy characters we know, <laughs> it? Well, it's, it's nuts, but... I do know a few straight goers, yeah. <laughs> you know. That's what he says. Um, <laughs> so, I always go back to the start with my guest, brother. Where you grew up and how it all began. Well, I grew up in Woolwich, which is South East London, you know, a normal working class family, mother, Irish immigrant, you know, came here in the 60s. Um, dad wasn't around much. Dad was an alcoholic. Dad was on the missing. Mother done the best she could. But, you know, it was tough times growing up. You know, I wasn't, um, I wasn't this tough kid or I wasn't this man who I've been portrayed now. I mean, as a child, I was... Very frightened, very, very full of fear. Didn't feel like I had no place anywhere, didn't belong. And I guess I started to act as a young, at a young age to, to try to be accepted, if you know what I mean. And uh, that meant, you know, I was pulled astray at a young age with the, with the young, the other kids on the estate. None of us had a lot. We didn't have a lot, no. And uh, we all stuck together. And inevitably, at some point, we all ended up going down the wrong road, but for a multitude of reasons. Yeah. So how how was your upbringing from ages from the teenage years? How was those years for you? You know what? It was it was quite tough. You know, there wasn't a lot of love to go around, but it was it was because it was tough times. You know, tough times. You know, my mother done the best she could, as did my stepfather. I had siblings. You know, I was at the bottom of the pile. You know, an older brother older sisters so you know it was a big family mm -hmm. it was a big family Billy did anything pardon were you Billy did anything well at school I was I used to have big ears you know I wasn't always as good looking as I am now <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite intimidated because you've got a lovely mane of air but thank you bro. No. <laughs> but uh, I used to have big ears my mm -hmm. ears used to stick out when I was a kid did you get them pinned back I did yeah. and this is this is one of the defining moments in, in my, my childhood I felt so inferior to other kids. I was so conscious of my ears. I actually took myself to the hospital, said to the doctors, I'm really sick of it and whatever. And they said, right, okay, we'll send you to get your ears, ears pinned back. Now, when I had my ears pinned back, I got my ears pinned back in the Queen Elizabeth Military Hospital, which was, uh, it was a military hospital. It's no longer a military hospital in Woolwich. And it was at the time of the Falklands War. And I was on the same wall as Simon Weston, who, who, I don't know if you know Simon Wesson, he got no. blown up on the Bismarck or something in the Falklands and he was all burnt, really badly burnt. I was on the same ward as him because it was a plastic surgery unit and with the um, 
the bandsmen who had been blown up at Hyde Park as well. They were there. Yeah. You know, and that's and that's one thing I highlighted that in my book. I said I never heard them moan once. You know, these were fellas. Uh, some of them had lost limbs. Simon Weston was uh, so badly burned. All I remember is they used to put him in a a cold bath in the morning and leave him there for hours because he was in he was in so much pain. And mm-hmm. uh, God, the resilience of them men, incredible. How old were you? I was about nine years old, I think, about nine. But what happened is there was a complication. When they done one of my ears, something went wrong. So I had to go on to this uh, uh, plastic surgery unit to have more constructive mm-hmm. work done on one of my ears. And because they were all military doctors, they all had, like, military names. And I was in a plastic surgery burns unit, and the person who done my operation was called Major Burns. <laughs> you, know, you, couldn't, yeah. you couldn't write couldn't this stuff, could you? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, how was it then? So burns. you were kind of bullied, and you just kind of I wanted was, it to yeah. stop. How was. was it then getting older? When age did you start kind of getting into crime? Well... I was bullied as a kid. I was full of fear. I wasn't one of these tough kids. I don't want to sit here and I was one of these big, hard kids and I was never a bully myself. Always hated bullies. But I started to get into crime and drugs probably when I was about 15, 16. And it was just silly little things like nicking car radios, uh, shoplifting, all this sort of stuff. And it was the norm. It was what people did. But again, you know, I don't make excuses for the bad choices I made. But at the time, I didn't really know much different. You know, it was tough times. It was a tough council estate. There was not a lot to go around. None of us had a lot. It was Thatcher's Britain. And in, in a lot of senses, we were the fucking lost generation. You know, the Conservative Party at the time invested in our future by building this big prison called Belmarsh, where I live. You know, my Woolwich is here. Belmarsh is here. And as quick as it was going up, the police used to come on the estate and they used to tell us, you're all going to be in there soon. Mm-hmm. And that was that was the truth. And yeah. some of us ended up in there for things we hadn't even fucking done. Didn't make much difference to Getting that. stitched up? Oh, m- most definitely. From what age? Uh, first time I got stitched up for something I hadn't done. Now, I don't want to paint this thing that I was always squeaky clean. I wasn't. I was doing bits and bobs or whatever. First time, uh, police burst through my house, six o'clock in the morning. I was in bed with my partner. I was about 17 years old because I was a young dad. I was a dad at 16. I was about 17 years old. He said, we've just seen you driving a nick car. You're under arrest. What are you fucking talking about? I'm in bed. No, we've just chased you. You've just come. And, you know, it's nothing to do with me. Nick me, charged me. Was I convicted? Of course I fucking was. Go to court. Guilty. <laughs> you know? What was your first sentence? Uh, my first sentence was a young offenders institution. I think I went away for... Seven months, I think. How that was that first, first time inside? If I'm to be brutally honest, I was quite, I was full of fear. I won't lie to you. You know, when I first walked through the doors of uh, Feltham, you heard all these stories about whatever or some whatever. But I was quite fortunate because although I was full of fear, the minute I got on the wing, I knew lots of people. So, mm-hmm. and it was always that way for me. You know, I'd end up going, and, and because I was from an estate with loads of people who were similar to me and whatever else. And if you, if you wasn't, if you didn't know someone, you knew their brother, their cousin or whatever. So I knew people from day one. Yeah. What is, you did know? you start boxing? I start. I was boxing as a kid. You know, I went to St. Peter's, yeah. which was... Uh, was that to stop the bullies? You know, I just went into it because it was it, it was there, it was available. Mm-hmm. We used to have PE classes. The, the caretaker of the school, Mr. Gange, was fantastic. And, and we used to have all the boxing bags and all that in the gym, you know. If I had my way, I'd bring it back in schools, but that's yeah. another another debate altogether. Yeah. And I started boxing there as a kid and uh, didn't really have that many amateur fights, but uh, I, I trained. I used to spar and train and train mm-hmm. and train. and Yeah, so I got into it quite young. Yeah. Yeah. What is? Did you start getting into serious stuff? Serious fighting yeah, or serious, serious crime? crime? Well, I suppose I started to get into serious crime in my early 20s. Yeah. My early 20s. Robberies? Robberies, yeah. Banks, post offices? Banks, post offices. The mall? Building societies, yeah. bureau de changes. What was it like doing your first job? First job, I was the driver on my one of my first jobs and then after that I was in yeah yeah and that was your, did you get a buzz for it 
Most definitely. Do you? I'd be lying if I said I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the starting point of getting a bit of money, getting a bit of power. Yeah. Yeah, but then we had a spate of, of shootings in our area. The police started shooting robbers. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember. It was um, a period where they had a shoot-to-kill policy. They had a unit called uh, PT-17. Yeah, they still got that of the night? Well, there's, it, there was SO-19, which was like the flying squad, sort yeah. of, whatever. I mean, I'm not a police expert, but I do know this squad was called PT-17. Mm -hmm. They were a fucking execution squad. And what they were doing was the, the armed robbery rate had gone up so high, they said, right, we're going to, whatever, I think it was Douglas Erd was the Home Secretary at the time, he said, take a few out, and that will get rid of, we were like the young cow, were we organised, were we like the fucking Ocean's Eleven? No, we fucking yeah. weren't. We were just game kids doing crazy fucking things. We could, we could have a robbery one day for 200 quid, and another day we'd have one for 10 grand. Mm -hmm. It was sometimes, I've done two in a week, I robbed the same post office four times in two months before, you know, mm. I'm not proud of it, but that's the sort of robbers we were. But anyway, mm. yeah, like it, on our area, there was uh, the generation just above me, three of them got shot, two of them got shot dead on a security van and my other friend, as he turned to run away, they shot him in the back. So that tells you They're not fucking what about. they were doing. Yeah, did that ever scare you to go? Um, Most definitely, and it brought, it brought the armed robbery rate down. Mm -hmm. And then what we'd done, Criminally, we were probably the original smash and grab gang. Yeah, you know, I don't know if you remember the ram raids and mm -hmm. whatever else. Killers. Well, we sort of started that off mm -hmm. like a uh, little crew that I was with, and we'd done a few crazy things like that, a few, f few good ones and a few funny ones. Did you become more <laughs> organised once you realised people were getting killed? Definitely. Yeah, hundred mm percent. -hmm. And the sort of clientele that would pull you in I mean there's when you're into the robbery game and all that sort of stuff there's a lot in the periphery you know you're talking about getaway cars and all sorts of bits and bobs and whatever and some of the more major gangs at the time that operate in our, our area because we were good at nicking cars and things these were, these were skills we learned when we was young nicking high performance vehicles or whatever they'd say right can you nick a motor and leave it somewhere for us or whatever and you go yeah no problem they'd give you a little and you don't know mm -hmm. whatever else happened, yeah. but you know mm -hmm. they want that car to do a bit of yeah. work and whatever. So there's, there's a lot that goes on. So there was a lot more organisation. Yeah. When did you get your first big sentence? I got my first big sentence in about 1994, I think it was, 94. I ended up getting five year, nine month. I got a three and a half year for a failed... It was going to be a robbery on a post office. We'd gone the day before and we, we had a, a thing where we used to foam the bell boxes. Back then they used to have these big, massive old bells and they didn't used to be alarmed, the actual post office. The, the, the alarm that you had on the outside was to, to what was called a trembler, which was on the safe. Mm -hmm. And that was the only part of the building that was alarmed. So what we used to do the day before is go and fill it with expandable foam so that if we went in the rob it and they set off the alarm, there it, it would there'd be no ring mm -hmm. or whatever. And we got caught. Uh, it, it doesn't. I can talk about it. It was in Dartford. We 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 got caught. My two of my friends got arrested at the scene because we'd done it quickly in a vehicle, and I got arrested a mile and a half away in a phone box. Mm -hmm. No evidence whatsoever. You know, really and truthfully, I should have been well on your way. But because of my affiliation to them and the police knowing I'm affiliated, yeah. I'm a mile and a half away, you're part of it. You're nicked. Yeah, and you got a five for that? I got No, I got three and a half year for that. And, and what happened is my two pals got two and a half year. One of them farted in the dock. I laughed and the judge gave me an extra 12 no months. I swear to God. What? I swear to fucking God. Mm -hmm. I laughed at my mate and, and they give me an extra fucking 12 months for laughing. Like uh, I was laughing at him. Mm -hmm. Did you think he was laughing <laughs> he was at the sentence? He thought I was laughing at the, the, the severity of it all sort of thing. <laughs> and then I got, on top of that, I got another uh, two and a half years for, uh, it, it was a high value burglary. I, I had over half a million pound out of mm. a big main post office in, in Bromley. Not in money, I had it in uh, items and whatever else. Back then you used to be able to get the phone stamps, electricity stamps and whatever. We used to take the fucking lot because you mm. could sell them. Yeah. You know, I, I, at times I had books of, 
electric said no one on my fucking estate paid an electric bill <laughs> <laughs> so in some senses yeah. it was like that sort of side of it, it was quite fucking fulfilling you yeah. should do a bit of a Robin Hood yeah, you know Robin Hood. you could pay yeah. your phone bill your electric mm. bill fucking everything heating everything on uh, that's how you must have known the and, and, and just been done if everybody's fucking well, the lights way that on. come on top is the way it, 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 it come on top for us all and we had a, there was an observation put on our little crew at the time was because we had to get the books to put the stamps in to sell them because you couldn't sell them in sheets. You had to put them in the books and you'd sell the books or thing. And some fucking idiot walked into a post office and asked for like 500 books or something. Mm -hmm. Someone associated yeah. to us. So they, obviously they thought this is a bit suspicious. Mm -hmm. They've tipped the other mob off and the next thing you know is all our doors have gone. Yeah. Did you have you know? a tight crew? Very much so. Yeah. Did every one of you do big sentences? Yeah. And some of them are dead. You know, I don't, on a job? Well, not on a job. Uh, I, you know, I'm not going to say names or anything. A couple have died, drug overdoses. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another friend of mine got murdered. Another one took his own life. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of us. Like, I mean, it's, um, you know, there might be 20 of us or whatever because mm -hmm. we all interacted yeah. from different estates or whatever else. I don't want to... And I laugh about it, whatever. I'm not laughing at the victims yeah, in course. it and whatever else. What I'm laughing at is the fucking craziness. Yeah. Or thinking you it was know, normal at one point. And thinking it was normal, mm -hmm. you know. My, yeah. my story's my story. Love me or hate me, it is what yeah. it is. But exactly, man. Listen, I'm totally the yeah. opposite now. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Listen, we've all got a story. And the thing is, crime sales. But we'll touch on all the change and the things yeah. that you're doing now. But sometimes, mate, you, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. I mean, it, it never ended up pretty. I mean, yeah. you know, I've got pals now that are doing 25 wrecks, 30 wrecks. 20 years and, yeah. and, and a lot of my friends end up with big big lumps of bird the generation under us I mean you look at you only got to look under us the, the, we looked up to the ones above us and the ones below us looked up to us and look at their story yeah. you know you've got from my area like the Lee Murray's and he, a formidable fella you know lovely lad I've known since he was this high hard as fucking nails game as fuck could, fucking UFC fighter and everything and you know, he ends up getting 25 years and it's fucking tragic. Mm -hmm. Tragic. Yeah, that's the uh, the majority of people come on the podcast say they're a product of the environment as well. Very it's, much And so. you'll tend to see there is a kind of link between abuse or bullying. Oh, well, let me tell you something about bullying. The biggest bullies in my area when I was a kid was the fucking old Bill, was the police, you know. I don't hate the police now. I respect them. We need them. I don't interact. I don't have any dealings with them because I live a law-abiding life. Mm -hmm. But as a kid, they were fucking bastards. We had, uh, we used to have anyone who's my age, I'm nearly 50 now, we had the SPG, which was the Special Patrol, Patrol Group. They were like a tactical support unit. They used to come onto the estates in our area, vans full of them, full of them, like a van with 10, 12 coppers in them. Oh, and they used to give you an idea, or they'd drag you. I mean... My own experience, they nearly killed me one night. They, they, they arrested me one night at a petrol station. I done fuck all wrong. They dragged me out of a car, snatched a petrol pump out of my hand, uh, and they put their foot on my back all the way back to the police station. I couldn't breathe. I was passing out in the back of the van. It was yeah. funny to them. You yeah. Know? So that's where the hate and rage can come towards the authorities, are. police, screws. Fucking scared of them when I was a kid. We all were. We yeah. were scared of them because they wouldn't just... It wasn't, you know, they could arrest you and charge and do... Who are you going to fucking complain to? Mm -hmm. The police? You know, this is in the days when I was criminally active when I was young. This is in the days before taped interviews and cameras and all that sort of stuff. Everything was done. They used to write it down. Piece of paper. Yeah, and we had this saying that anyone from my year will tell you verbal. What they would do is fucking write things. You know, and, and, and the, the older criminals in, in our area used to say, if you ever get to never sign a statement, but they'd sign it for you. But they say, if you ever do put MUD and it means made under duress, like I don't, yeah. know, I don't know if we thought it was these international mm -hmm. fucking terrorists or something. <laughs> but many a time when I was arrested, when I was young, I said, I didn't fucking say that. Mm -hmm. I didn't say that. Yeah. I didn't say that. Like, I, I admitted to doing this and doing that, and I said this, and I, I fucking said that. You know, they'd. Crooked as fast. Pre, Pre-prepared statement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? When you get out of jail after your first sentence, yeah. the, after your, was it four, five, three and a half? Yeah. What, yeah. what was your life like then? Did you go straight back into well, crime? Well, do you know what? I, I, I went into the smuggling world then, but I tried to I tried to go straight. 
I did. I'd be lying if I said didn't because I don't think, you know, criminality and crime and all that stuff. So you see people and you say, oh, he's a criminal, whatever, and you can write him off, whatever. I don't believe anyone's fucking truly criminal. I believe if, a, if someone's earning... 10 grand a week doing crime, you'd think, fucking hell, they're smart. But what if you could say something like, I'll well, give you 10 grand a week to do something legal. I'm sure they'd pick the legal option. Mm-hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? I did try. But the trouble is, once you're labelled, once you're in that mix, it's against you. You know, society doesn't forgive. It's based on fucking retribution. We all like to say people get out of prison, give them a second chance and whatever else. Go to prison and get out and see how many chances you yeah. get. So you started going you know, down the smuggling route? I did, yeah, from people I'd met in jail. I've always been very good with people. Mm-hmm. And the one thing I'm not is fucking dumb. I'm not stupid. And I'm as staunch as they come. I'll, my mouth shut, I don't blag and all that sort of stuff. And uh, What were you smuggling gear, Charlie? Smart. Yeah, at the time, though, at the time, cannabis. Hash? Yeah, this was in the 90s. We were smuggling cannabis. Yeah. From abroad? Yeah, plenty Spain? of it and all. yeah. yeah. Yeah, up, they were bringing it up from Spain. Mm-hmm. It was coming down from Holland as well, into France. It was coming back via day trippers and whatever else. And my job, I used to go out. There was a there was a situation where we'd have the the Dutch would bring it down into France, and one of us would go to meet the Dutch, take it from the Dutch, and give it to the day tripper because you, you never wanted the two to meet. Mm-hmm. Never wanted the two to meet. The Dutch, in my experience, don't trust them. They're iffy fuckers. MI5 and all them people and all these security services and all that, that is where they operate. That's where all their snitches are out there. But anyway, cut a long story short. So he would never meet the day tripper. And this was at the time when the uh, a lot of the European football matches were on and whatever else. And it was a smuggler's fucking paradise. The people I work with had the best routes. What customs officer wants... There's 10 coaches of English fans coming through at the pool. What, what customs officer wants to get a load of pissed up English fans off on the dock and start searching them? It's going to get them fuckers through. Mm-hmm. So we'd have a day, well, the people I work for would have a day, day, people coming over either as day trippers or coming over as football fans. I would have met the Dutch a few days before. I'd be plotted in an hotel. I'll meet them at the match, give them the bags that go on the coach. You just sling them on. The, if, the, if it come on top on the coach, the worst thing that's going to happen... How many kilo? Uh, 30 at time 40 mm-hmm. at time 50 at time when we done the runs on the ribs because we done that as well a yeah. couple actually across the channel, channel on ribs it was bigger quantities ever get know. caught I never know but no. uh, but someone who I work with did through stupidity yeah someone in Glasgow used to do the, the hash runs man but they used to do it they used to take the school kids over <laughs> to Spain. I know people who are, it's despicable. <laughs> it's not like the money involved. But they used to take the school kids, man, and just, and you're talking hundreds uh, of kilos. I know kilos. people have done it on uh, yeah. old people. Yeah, somebody wrote that. It was in someone's book in Glasgow, man. I was uh, like, fucking I'm hell. not making it right. Yeah, I know, yeah. but, you know, but the, the lengths you go to to yeah. make a crust and the people who you use is, is, is next level shit, isn't it? I mean, the crew I work with at the time, I mean, I'm not giving it, I'm the big fucking mighty mm. organiser. I wasn't, I, I was a pivotal player and played the role, but I was only a soldier. I wasn't the Mr. Biggs, the big brains. Yeah. You know, the people I worked for were very successful. Mm-hmm. Right? They knew what the fuck they were doing. Yeah. Did you get caught for that? No. I'd got caught, I eventually got caught and got 10 years for people smuggling, for smuggling so people into what, Britain. what kind of people? Like refugees? Well, this, yeah, this women. is in the days. I mean, this was 99, 2000. I think I got nicked in 2000, my memory shows me. This is before the days of the open borders and whatever. Then the Russians wanted to preempt it. You know, the Russia had broken up into all the little states, hadn't it? Georgia, uh, what was it? You had Georgia, the... Kosovo, all these places, mm-hmm. Serbia and all these, it'd be wars out there and everything. They wanted to preempt it. It was people knew that eventually they'd be allowed in anyway, but at the time they wasn't. So the the people I work with, the, the gangs that they were working with out there, you know, they were highly organised firms, you know, uh, all throughout the continent. And we ended up involved with them and bringing people into the UK. Mm-hmm. So you went from bank robbery, smuggling, drugs to smuggling people and you got a 10 for that there's no it's fu- yeah it's fucking crazy isn't it yeah. yeah so what was your 10 like where did you go what well, prison at first I didn't like it because between me and you I was I, I was the, uh, I'm actually the first person in this country to be banned from holding a British passport no the second second the first one before me was uh, a fella called Perry Wacker Perry Waker he was a he was a Dutchman and what happened is he got 
he had 52 people in a lorry and they all died, didn't they? I don't know if you remember. And um, he got banned from holding a British, upholding a passport. And I got banned as well for holding a passport because this was when people smuggling first started. You know, I didn't really want to get involved in this people smuggling. I wasn't a willing participant. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of reasons why I'd done what I'd done. And I was sort of, I was duped into doing it. And I only ever done it the once. And I got caught when I fucking done it. But uh, like I say, I was actually arrested in France. I didn't commit an offence in Great Britain. I should have been tried, arrested in France. But because it was this new big thing, this people smuggling, and Britain had realised what a security threat it was for the country, they sent a team of customs over to Coquel in France. They extradited you? What they'd done is they duped me and said, we need to uh, take you to hospital to make sure you're fit to be questioned. And they drove me over into the English control oh. zone. They charged you? I said he's now under arrest. Drove me back. Did to they England. have a warrant for that? Nope. It was totally illegal. Every move they fucking done was illegal. Technically, I was kidnapped by British mm -hmm. Customs and brought back to the UK because of the the people smuggling at the time was such a big thing, and they didn't want it to be uh, a new trend. A new, exactly. So they wanted to give deterrent sentences or whatever else. But what happened to me is when I got and this is Albert. This goes on to how I became British most wanted man. When I was uh, arrested, you know, it was. The people I'd worked for, you know, I was fucking pissed. I'd been stitched up, basically set up, because this wasn't a firm I usually work with. I'd mm -hmm. been put into them, cut a long story short. And um, I thought, fuck this, I need to go and sort this out. So they took me to Folkestone Court a week later. I was remanded into custody, obviously. I was in uh, Canterbury Prison, and I was taken to Folkestone Magistrates Court. Now, Folkestone Magistrates Court was a high security court, believe it or not, because of the... If you get nicked with smuggling, and some of these cases, people get nicked at the ports, Dover, folks, and whatever, some of them are nicked with big fuck-off parcels, and some of them are, like, major whatever, so they, it's a high security court. I thought, how the fuck am I going to get out of here? So I, I worked out a plan. I thought, the only way I'm going to get out is I need to make some sort of weapon that's intimidating enough. And at the time, I thought... Right, I'll get a pen, so I've got a big pen, a paper clip, and I filled it up with black currant jam. And I took the prison officer hostage in the courtroom and said, if I don't open the doors, I'm going to inject him. So they opened all the doors. So at the time, they opened the doors and let me go. When I eventually got arrested three months later, I was done for 23 false imprisonments, including the fucking judge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fuck's sake. Madness. What sentence did you get? The 10? I've got another three year consecutive so you get for 13. that. Yeah, another three years on top for that. Mm -hmm. Where did Which, you go to when you were on the run? Uh, do you know what? I'd like to say, yeah, I went to Spain and I had a big pot of money and all that. I didn't. I ended up going back to my area, what I knew, where I knew best. You know, sometimes you're better off hiding under their nose and you, you go back to where you mm -hmm. know best. And uh, I wasn't in the best place mentally at the time. That's how I got into that, you know, I was using drugs at the time, I was using cocaine and whatever else. I, I, I think I'd reached a crossroads, I'd had enough of the crime and everything. And I think that was the first sort of struggle with me where I was struggling mentally and I didn't, didn't understand depression and things like that at the time, but I was struggling mentally because the act of escaping, even after I'd done it, you know, after I'd escaped and I broke out of the cult, you know, there was no one waiting for me outside on a motorbike to whiz me away or mm -hmm. anything like that. You know, I went down the beach, Folkestone Beach, and, and I see the police helicopter flying about looking for me or whatever else, so, and I saw a woman with a baby, and I thought, oh, st stop, and I sort of lied down and I talked to her, or whatever, so they've obviously just, mm -hmm. you know, and then, I, and then three hours later, I bunked a train back to fucking Woolwich and ended up in a... A uh, fucking a drug dealer's house saying, fucking, I've just escaped. And he's going, yeah, shut up, you fucking idiot. And then the, the, the six o'clock news comes on, police are looking for this man, do not approach all this bollocks. And that weren't nice, you know, to see that. I think that was that hit home. And then obviously, I uh, armed police at my mum's looking for me, uh, going around my. My, my ex-partner's house looking for me, fucking everyone looking for yeah. me. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't yeah. nice. That's the hard thing when the, the coppers terrorise the family. Oh, there's nothing nice about being on the run. I was yeah. on the run for like about four and a half months before they eventually caught me. Where did they catch you? In my home area. <laughs> <laughs> did you never think about... Like, but do you know what? To, did you never think about doing another ton and getting to fuck? Listen, at the time... 
I knew I was fucked. Mm -hmm. I knew the minute I was nicked, I was in a lot of trouble. I knew, you know, I'm not a stupid yeah. man. I Potentially knew I was, a lifer. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. With my record as well at the mm, time, previous. I'd already had a conviction for firearms, mm -hmm. section 18 and whatever else. And But I, when when I got caught, it was almost a relief. But when I was on the run, the, the, the fear, you know, I, I, I you know, they're going to shoot me. They're going to shoot me. That's that's mm. what I was thinking because I'd, I'd had a conviction for firearms. For, and, uh, anyone who's been arrested for firearms will tell you that when you're arrested for firearms, you have this marker against you. It's like even to this day, if a police car comes up behind my vehicle and my name comes Cold up, flag up, they won't stop me. Not one car. Mm. Before they pull me over, there'll be three or four I'm cars. Armed response? Yeah. Because of the... The, um, the danger. The danger. Those what was your 13 like? What jail did you go to? Well, most of it high security. Well, yeah. You know? Yeah, and I'm not saying that, but ego effect, but obviously because of the escape mm. and whatever else, most of it was in high security. I was up in the dispersal system, um, long larting, and uh, yeah, that was... Uh, you in Belmarsh? I was in Belmarsh, yeah. You had yeah, me Bronson? Belmarsh. I've been in with Bronson twice. How about Charlie? Do you know what? He's I actually like, seen... He's getting out next year. I was in the block with him. I was in the seg with him because I, I used to be a little fucker in jail. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to think it was a laugh and plan. However, in yeah. 1995, I was in the seg with him in, in High Down. And uh, I got to know him then. I used to speak to him through the wall. He used to have his exercise yard. He'd go out and just train like a lion. Do you know what he's, uh, what I say about Charlie is fucking release him. He's you next know, year. He's, he got his appeal today. Who would you rather have living next door to you? Charlie Bronson or a fucking or a child killer? And the yeah. reality of it is, there's child killers that have served fucking the court for yeah. He's no danger to anyone. He'll go on to be a celebrity or whatever else. Mm -hmm. he's, he's a danger to them. Charlie doesn't assault prisoners or anything. He's actually a really nice guy. Is he reformed you now? Pardon? Is he reformed then? It's not for me to say, yeah. you know. Yeah. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to wind him up. And <laughs> is he a big boy? Is he a strong? He's a very strong man. He's is a it? circus strong man, isn't he, Charlie? Yeah. He's a circus strong mm -hmm. man. I wrote to him when my book came out. You know, he was. I wrote to him and said to him, and he was kind enough. In my book, he done me a drawing and he mm -hmm. said, "Box smart, Ray. You done good." And that meant a lot because. Mm -hmm. You know, be patronising to say I know he feels. You know, I've done a lot of seg myself. I've done some high security jails and very high security conditions. But you can't even comprehend what it must be like to be in the seg as long as he's been yeah. in there. You know, you can't yeah. even comprehend it. Some and he's not the only one. Yeah. There's a lot of others in there that you don't hear about because they're not got the celebrity status. You know, like Tony Steele and Bob Maudsley and people like that. They've Who been in the seg 30 odd years. Who are they? Well, Bob Maudsley, I was in the Long Larkin seg with him. He's he he killed three people in jail. Bob Maudsley, he killed three sex offenders up in Wakefield Jail, and he he came out on the wing one day. He we killed one in Broadmoor, and then he he was in Wakefield, and uh, uh, he came out one morning and said to the prison officers, "There were two off this morning," and they just looked at him and thought, "What are you doing? What are you doing? He'd killed them both and put them under their beds." But he's been in segregation now for. 35 years mm -hmm. you know you don't hear about these cases who's the other man you mentioned sad. there Tony Steele Tony Steele's from from my area from Woolwich I remember Tony as a kid and Tony went uh, Tony got nicked for I think he went away for nicking a milk float or something crazy like that and he that was about 25 years ago he's been in prison ever since all for crimes committed in prison assaults on prison officers and whatever else and he'd get 10 year and I think he got life for assault in prison officers or whatever and they threw him off the they threw him off the roof in Whitemore prison officers threw him off the roof he managed to get up on the roof and the, the prison officers grabbed him whatever I can't say they threw him off but people I spoke to said they fucking threw him off they said he jumped but but he survived it but mm -hmm. yeah he's been in the sex for years people so how was that, that sentence when did you decide to go to Grendon well what happened you know I'm coming across like a bit of a nutter here, but... <laughs> you are a fucking nut, mate. Enjoy it. What happened? <laughs> in 2002, I, w I was in uh, Long Line. You know, and I, I did that wall. You know, mm. where they say... Just sick of that life. Conscience becomes a fierce pursuer. And the life I'd lived, you know, I'd lived that fucking life. You know, I don't talk bollocks. You know, I'd lived it, seen it, done it. There's things I would never talk about, but I'd lived it, seen it, done mm -hmm. it in more ways than one. 
And I'd reached that road and I went to therapy in Dovegate. You know, they took me off the playlist and I went up to Dovegate. I thought, right, I'm going to give it give it a go because they'd half sold it to me. Mm. And that was all the way up in New Toxic. But the thing was, it was too far away and I'm a Londoner through and through and they've stuck me in this jail right up north. There was two fellas on the wing who, who in my eyes at the time were fucking no good. One of them was, uh, you know... Arthur Rongan, like one of the other lot, he, he, he come out, we was doing this group thing and he said he'd been flashing the school kids or something. And then I had a little scam up there of another fella. We were getting bits sent in the post and nick a few quid like you do when you're in jail, trying to make it a bit better for yourself. And this other one grasped us up. So one day I thought, right, well, that's it, they got to go. And at lunchtime, I, I'd done the pair of them with a honey jar. So I got nicked for two bad Section 18s when I was in... Um, and this is... This, the police are not all bad... Because what happened, I got nicked with these two Section 18s and um, Derbyshire police come to arrest me, obviously. You know, and I'm already doing 13 year, two Section 18s, my record, get lifed off or, or get another big lump of bird. The cop has come into the seg to, to interview me and he's, he's looked out the door like that and he's gone, we know they were wrong ones. He went, <laughs> he went, just say he went to it, yeah, and you stuck your arm up in the honey jar with him. He said, I'm happy with that. I went, yeah, that's what happened. He went, sweet, you won't hear from us again. And I never fucking did. <laughs> so you could have got a life off of that? I got a life, and they, went, they knew one of them was in a fucking flash or something else. Mm -hmm. And the other one was fucking no good. I never know what he was mm -hmm. in for. But the old Bill knew they were no good. They knew it's a prison assault. They don't give a shit. You know, when you're in prison, you can kill each other long as you don't kill us that's their philosophy and i'll mm. go into that with a prison especially the high security prisons but yeah they sort of went but then the downside of that was obviously i was made the high security again back to long line now when i was in long line they put me straight back into segregation because of me assaults on and whatever else i think you're a danger to other people and they was worried about my mental health at the time as well because i of the outbursts and whatever and because of my escape. When you escape and use them extreme methods, not that they consider you dangerous, they think you're fucking off your head. And in some senses they were, but off their head people can be quite dangerous. But cut a long story short, when I was in the segregation, two psychiatrists, when you're in the segs in high security jails, they're called, you know, most jails are called segregation. When you're in the high security jails, they're called special care and control units. They change the name to make it sound a bit more PC. But what that means is you have to be assessed by psychologists and psychiatrists. Every dispersal prisoner does. There's only six maximum security prisons in the country. And when you're in them, you get assessed by psychiatrists and psychologists. You go one route. You either progress through the system, or if they think you're too dangerous, you ain't going nowhere. The options for me were the severe and dangerous personality unit at Whitemore, because they thought I was dangerous or go back into therapy and give it another go. The psychiatrist tapped the pen on the tabletop. He said, one signature, and I can send you to Broadmoor. And you know what? That, that fucking scared me, because I knew he weren't joking, because I'd seen it happen. I'd seen people go, you know. Psychiatrists, two psychiatrists go, yeah, we think he needs, he's criminally whatever he needs. He's a dangerous society. You're off to Broadmoor. And if you go to somewhere like that, you ain't coming out till you're old. You know, it's not like you go there and have six months or whatever. You go there, you're fucking lost. Or they will chemically lobotomy me. Yeah, they'll get, like, like the one flew over the cookies. Yeah, they'll yeah, just yeah, keep yeah. filling you up with psychotropic meds till you're off your fucking head. Yeah, and you'll want to stay there. You won't want to go just anywhere. Just dumb you down. If you was to go there and walk around the case, these people have been there 35, 40 years. Mm -hmm. There's a fella in there, I read about it a few years ago. He burnt a haystack as a kid. He's been in there 45 fucking years. That's what you're up against. Yeah. You're That's their control yeah. measure. You're going in there sane and coming out insane? Or dead. Yeah. Or dead. Could that scare you then? Most definitely. Because I was sane, but at the same time there was something wrong with me. I didn't know what it was, but... I believe what's always been wrong with me is like addiction and that stuff, but also I'll go into it later because I'm quite open about mental health. I was diagnosed mm -hmm. as being bipolar further down the line, but yeah, that 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 was my options. And then I thought, you know what? All I knew about Grendon, it's like Terry Ellis says so yeah. beautifully, you know, Terry's book's fantastic. And when he says about um, it's full of wrong ones and full of beasts, well, at the time I was quite fortunate. Because the new one had opened in um, 
Dovegate, the numbers had gone right down in Grendon. So what they were trying to do was empty the dispersals out of prisoners. They go, right, well, you want to go down? So they started taking armed robbers and normal career criminals and whatever else. So when I went there, you know, I was very fortunate that there was people I already knew from the system. Other people had gone from the dispersal system. Uh, three, two other fellas, sorry, came from Long Lighting with me who were both normal stand-up, since both, both lifers, both in for murder, but what I would call my own, like, mm-hmm. decent criminals all right they were nicked for murder that's their story but yeah. who was it then going there at first was that a tough decision for oh, you most definitely most definitely breaking down the ethos and the barriers and all that stuff but i was very fortunate you know because people know me and know what i'm about people you know i'm not including me big gangs and a britain's mo- uh like london's biggest feared fucking gang who fucking wants to be yeah but what I am is quite well known in the system. Well, I was back then, and I was well known for probably all the wrong reasons, but amongst my own for the right reasons, for being staunch, for standing up with people, for standing firm with people, for standing tall, and standing up to authority, which I've done on numerous occasions. You know, I earned my stripes more than once. You know what I mean? And uh, so I was known for being staunch. So I had a... You know, water finds its own level, like attracts like. So whenever I've been in prison, especially high security estates, I've attracted the best of the best. And I'm friendly with some of the, what you would call the elite of the Britain's criminal underworld or whatever, people that you would read about, whatever. I'm very friendly with a lot of them people. And certain people I love and respect dearly, like Kevin Lane and people like that in Long Line. And I went and said to them, look, I'm thinking about going to this therapy and all that. And do you know what? in prison you make friendships you forge friendships you know if you're a fraud and all that you get found out and and people like that are so stomped that they said to me you know what Ray it's got to be better than here it's the best movie and when you hear it from people like that like proper staunch people you sort of go mm. I'll give it a go yeah. You go to fucking wankers, they'll go, oh, it's all full of fucking wrongers, full of nonsense, yeah. full of this, full of that. Half of them are absolute cunts themselves, do you know what I mean? Yeah. A sensible person, a true friend, will tell you the truth and say, do what's yeah. best for you. Because Grendon's known as one of the most evilest prisons oh, the, for the prisoners with child killers, child rapists, oh, you, bad, you bad had people. But from No Razor Smith, who's been on it, changed his life. Terry Ellis, been there, changed his life. It takes courage and respect for anybody to admit they've got a problem and potentially this is a last chance to make changes. Part of the reason why I love Razor Smith so much is I, I attribute Razor Smith to uh, half saving my life. And another person I'd like to mention just briefly, Louis Birch, God bless his soul. Who's he? Louis was prolific arm robber, prolific security van robber and all that in the 80s and 90s. He died recently. But when I first went to Grendon... Louis Birch was there. Louis was on, and I knew Louis from Woolwich. You know, Louis was old school, as hardcore as they come. And Razor, Razor turned up from Whitemore the same fucking day I turned up from Long Larkin. And I knew Razor because I'd been with Razor in, uh, in I Down in the 90s. You know, I knew he was started his writing and where else. But Razor is as staunch as they come, you know, proper. You know, I've been in Belmarsh with Razor. He, he, he's a staunch fucking prisoner. Yeah, fucking and the game. minute I see him there, mm-hmm. and uh, another fella, Freddie Lunn, and and the, the two fellas that I come with but from Long Larkin, who I was already quite pally with, a decent fella, we had our own little crew. And our take on it was, fuck them, we're here for us. Mm-hmm. And we all carried each other through it. And I was there for three years. You know, it was a fucking tough How was it working years. on yourself, getting therapy, psychology? I would say, for me, best thing I ever done. Best thing I ever done. Not easy. It's an ongoing process. I didn't come out of there a closed book, but I started to break down the barriers. There was, um, you know, when I went there, it was us and them. I hated screws, hated authority. Mm -hmm. A lot of experience of uh, prison brutality and all that stuff. I'd been on the receiving end of it. I'd witnessed it, the injustice of it or whatever. But... uh, the officers there were different, you know, Joe Chapman, Paul Johnson, you know, these people there, dedicated, dedicated to helping us change our life for us and to fucking stop creating victims. And they made us see it, challenged us, told, asked us questions and told us things that we'd never encountered before. My, my way of dealing with everything was attack. Here's a classic example. I'd been there three months 
someone sent me in a CD, and I really wanted this CD, like a kid. I really wanted this CD. So I've gone up reception to get this CD, and the prison officer behind the counter said, you can't have it. You're not allowed to miss a prohibited item or whatever. I thought, you cunt. First thing I've done, I've jumped the counter to attack him, you know. And he Paul Johnson's grabbed me, pulled me back, pinned me up against the wall. Rather than trying to hit me and bundle me or bend me up, take me to the block, he's gone, where are you now? Where are you? And I was like, what do you mean? Where fucking are you now? Meaning, where are you mentally? Mm-hmm. And it brought me back to childhood. When I was a kid and, you know, when I, and, I, and loss and yeah. not having things as a kid and all this stuff. It just, it just it's mad how it yeah. fucking works. Getting neglected, feeling a bit of abandonment that, issues. All that And that was your defence mechanism, getting angry. Attack. Yeah. Attack. And you identified all that while in there. Yeah. What was it like, your first therapy session being open? Did you talk about your bullying and stuff? Was that the first? Not really. you ever spoke about no, it? No, it's a process. It takes time. Yeah. It takes time. I, I, I was more like, listen, a bit cautious. We'd have our own little therapy sessions. Me, Razor, and uh, Freddie and that, we'd go and we'd have our own little talks in the, in the, in the cell. Most of the time, it'd be that fucking nonce, that cunt, this, that, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> the usual prison yeah. stuff. But that becomes tiring. It's like when you're in prison, everyone wants to talk about fucking crime. Crime's fucking boring. Let's talk about something else. Everyone mm-hmm. wants to talk about football. Fuck football, they're faggots. Yeah. You know, I want to, you know what I mean? It's, yeah, so we used to do our own little therapy sessions. It might sound mad, but we were encouraged to do that. Mm-hmm. You, you know, you, 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 you're opening, you're starting to open up in a way you never did before. Yeah. How did you handle you being know? round all the, the serial fucking evilness of some of those well, prisoners? The beauty of it, and I'm not just saying this, there wasn't that many on our wing. Mm-hmm. And the reason there wasn't that many on our wing is because there was so many... There were so many hardcore people like myself and Razor Bang and Freddie and whatever. Yeah, they was trying to, yeah. let's see if this works for this mob now, yeah. rather than just the beast. Yeah, that's still bad, but I'm talking about the child killers, the fucking evil, evil people. So well, they were kind of kept away from they you? They kept them away from us because mm-hmm. they knew... Shit could kick off. At, well, they would feel too intimidated to do their work. You know, the one thing I will say about them people is this. If they're there for the right reason and they do the work on themselves, that they don't go out and create another victim, full respect to them, full respect to them. And I'm sure there's been many success cases. If they're there working their ticket, they got found out because you can't kid a kid out. And the thing about people like myself, people who have grown up in prisons and done so much bird is we can see straight through the bullshit and cut straight through the bullshit. So we give a lot of them an hard time. But in doing that, I think we fucking played our own little bit in helping mm-hmm. either rehabilitate them or we didn't but we but you get an understanding and the thing is especially with them what I will say about a lot of these people not to say about rapists about murderers whatever the amount of them when you actually hear their stories and why they're the way they are it's fucking horrific what some of these people have been through themselves you know they were put into care homes as kids put into care homes by the state to be looked after and protected and whatever else, and they were fucking nonce themselves and abused and passed from care home to care home to care home, abused, 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 abused. That was all they fucking knew. Mm-hmm. So when some of them, and believe you me, I'm not making excuses for them, but when some of them went on to be like that themselves, you sort of go, well, did we fail them as a society? Yeah, In some, some cases, yes. Scary, yeah. Scared to fucking think, man. No one's born like that, are they? That's what I'm yeah. trying to say. It's like, I, I can't say, oh, I went out committing robberies and putting guns in people's face and all that. That makes me in some way better. I would never harm a woman or a child intentionally. And I, that sort of, that stuff sickens me and disgusts me. Mm-hmm. But I was so at a place in myself where I wanted to fucking change and have some sort of quality of life myself and, and, and have a decent life beyond jail that I was willing to tolerate them to a degree, not get pally with them or anything like that, but not attack them. Whereas to try in the past, and you try to be more understanding everybody's stories and understanding the background. I would attack them like that in the past. Yeah. It's, it's your duty Is in that jail. the work ingrained and it changes your mindset to look at things differently well it changes your mindset and everything's a deflection the greatest you know if someone if you're fucking a bad person yourself you'll pick out the badness in others if you're a good person you'll find the good in others so eventually what Grendon done for me is after a few months of being there once we'd exhausted all that he's a wrong and he's a cunt he's a this bollocks you start to look at yourself and that's when it became real 
And that's when some people either stick it out or some people go. And there's many times I wanted to flee, many times I wanted to run, but I'd have like Big Brother Razor or someone say, stick it out, come on, stick it out, we're all in this, come on, stick mm-hmm. it And, and we, we pulled each other through, you know. The three years that you were there, when you were going through all your therapy sessions, did you grow a conscience and think about all the victims, like the robberies and stuff 100%. like that? Does that 100%. become sad? Was there a lot of tears? I'd be lying. I'd be lying if I said I'm a weeper. And you know why? Because I'm a thinker. You know, my pain has always been... Overthinking. I overthink stuff and whatever else. Did I get in touch with difficult emotions? Yes. Do I feel sorrow, pity, sadness for the victims I've created? Most definitely. But it doesn't come out with tears for me. The way it came out with me is in self-destruction. Drug abuse. Beating myself up. Putting myself in that way of life in the fucking first place. Crime, criminality, especially violent crime, is a form of self-harm. You might think you're harming someone else, but hurt people hurt people. And that's my experience. And it took therapy for me to actually understand and realise that. You know, and since I've made a change, I don't hurt people today. Do you know what I mean? It's because I understand if I'm feeling that way, it's because I'm fucking hurting. You know, mm-hmm. for whatever else, for yeah. any unresolved guilt. Yeah, or whatever. I think harming others is a self, a self harm, and I also think taking drugs is self harming. One hundred percent. It's, it's kind of someone had had someone on my show, and he says like they didn't want to live, but they didn't want to die. They yeah. just didn't know where they were, so the, the drugs was just pure escape. The Charlie, yeah. the everything. Were you taking drugs? In the jail before Grendon? Were you on the I, gear? I, I, I had a period, but then I had a period in Long Larting where in Long Larting it really frowned upon. When you ran mm. on a wing with like proper sensible fellas, they're not really into the drugs, it's more the booze. And what they do in... Hooch. Hooch. In the dispersal system, what the screws do, it's a control measure. Listen, there's bods in there, got fuck all to lose. They're doing life sentences, 30 wrecks, all sorts. You know, they want to have a booze. The screws will let them... As long as you don't beat us up, and t- you can have it. But once people start playing up, what they do is they turn it into a desert. They come in, they, they spend the centre search, search squads in, nick everyone's booze. That pisses off the faces and the daddies and the wing and whatever. You fucking idiots playing up and all that. They've come and fucking nicked all our booze. So it's, it's a bit of we'll give come and, go. and take. You know what I mean? It's mm. a bit of a control measure. So in the dispersals, people mainly drink. And I did drink, but drink makes me... Drink turns me into a nasty fucker. You know, I get involved in all sorts of... I ain't drunk for years, but... Yeah, yeah but drink, I, yeah, I get rowdy. Push you over the edge. Oh, yeah. Well, it did then because mm. I was emotionally very damaged, very scarred. I hadn't done any therapeutic work on myself, yeah. so I'd have a booze and it'd be, let's have a row. And, and I'd want to start attacking the staff or something stupid. What jail were you... Prison riot? No, I was never, no, right never, no, I've never been as I've never been fortunate enough to be in a riot. <laughs> but if I could have caused one, I probably yeah. would have done. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've, I've I've never been involved in any riots mm-hmm. or protests mm-hmm. with anyone else because I don't want to drag anyone into my box. Yeah. Let me tell you something about prison riots. Prison riots go like this. Mr. Fucking whatever has got the fucking hump. He gets his fucking boys and then he sits back. You know, I'm not the one going to take the flag. You poor fuckers are. I'll stand up for my rights and other prisoners' rights, but I'll take myself down. I ain't taking you down with me. I'm not going to ask you to come and battle this screw with me. If I had a problem with a screw, I'd go and put it on him myself. Yeah. Because I'm staunch like that. Yeah. See, you after know. your three years at Grendon, was it your choice to go or how, did, how does it work? Well, what happened for me, you know, I'd done so much extensive work there and I really, really done well. And the one thing I will say about Grendon, I don't say this stuff for a fair ego or whatever, I actually got an award from the Lord Chief Justice at the time because what happened is towards my... I still had f- over three years left to serve when I was when I was coming to the end of Grendon. I, still, I weren't going home, you know what I mean? But what actually happened is I started... Uh, a little project in there, me and a couple of others. We started going out to schools and things with a prison officer. I used to go out, I went out on four or five occasions with a prison officer, gave a talk to the to the, to the uh, students or whatever else about crime and how it doesn't pay and about drugs and whatever else. I'd done that. And all the time I was in therapy, you know, I'd, I'd started a degree as well in long Latin. You know, I studied, I'd done a degree in psychology with the Open University. And I'd done that at the same time as I was doing therapy, believe it or not. I used to go back to my cell, do my degree and whatever else. And I was getting like past once, you know, this is someone who'd never been 
I've never been to school in it. Well, I did go to school, but I wasn't educated. School was just a fucking laugh. I left school with not a single qualification. I think I left there with someone's bike I nicked, but <laughs> no, that was my yeah. qualification. But, you know, I'd left Grendon. You know, I was just a year from getting my degree and everything. And, and, and two officers put me up for an award, and I got an award from the Lord Chief yeah. Justice, which is, it's, it, it's, mm-hmm. it's in me. I, I included it in my book, if I remember rightly. I think I did, yeah. I, I, well, I got an award. For, oh, there you go, look. Yeah. As a special recognition to the process. Personal rehabilitation. Personal yeah, congratulations, man. Well, for, for me, a, put that on the camera. That was for, like, the work I put in. And did that, that make you feel good? You know what, it felt nice. Is that the first thing you'd ever felt proud of? Uh, which was natural? I'd got the education bug when mm-hmm. I started studying and I was getting my marks and grades. I was yeah. like, fucking brilliant. And I discovered that I could write, you know, I couldn't, I never writ. I don't think I'd ever writ, I'd writ a few letters, that was it. You know, as you know, I went in to write a book, but mm-hmm. I discovered I could write. It, it, it did feel nice. It felt like in some ways I was being accepted and I was turning a corner. I think when I first started Grendon, I thought I'd, I'll just keep up the act and it'd just be an act and I'll just act my way through. But it became a point when it became very real like the fight or flight, and it, and it actually did start to work for me. And by the time I left there, I actually fucking believed wholeheartedly in the process of rehabilitation, and I actually started to believe that it was possible for me because my thinking had started to change. And what they'd done for me, they were absolutely fantastic. They put a great care package together for me to try and support me to further it. And I went to a prison in um, uh, Richmond, Surrey. It's not there no more, another great thing to prison systems done has closed all the good resettlement prisons and it was what's called a resettlement prison and I went there for two two and a bit years and for the last 13 14 months of my sentence I was out working Monday to Friday I used to go out I had a job at a scaffold firm and I used to go to work and come back to the prison of a night time and it had been my first experience really of holding down a job working getting a bit of money learning to budget and all that stuff it was phenomenal the way it, it all sort of mapped out you know yeah. it was really good how much do you think you spent from the ages of 16 until you got out of prison how long did i spend no in how prison? much do you think money you've spent over the years from <sighs> drugs squandering uh, at party lifestyle millions no i wouldn't say millions i've not had millions hundreds of thousands yeah undoubtedly hundreds and, of thousands and it's scary to think that 20 years of your life for that money and, and now you're successful now and, and it's natural yeah. and you're doing it work perfect. But again, if you never went through all this shit in your past, <laughs> you wouldn't be where you are today. You wouldn't be where you are today. You wouldn't be reading books. I boots, earn more money I mean? today than what I ever did criminally. <laughs> it's fucking yeah. mad, isn't it? It's mm-hmm. like I employ people, you know, I have my own yeah, business. I, have my own, I, you know, I own a, mm-hmm. a scaffold company, you know, I employ people. People are dependent on me. I pay my fucking tax. Mm-hmm. I've got an accountant, I pay me tax. You know, the other day he was saying about, We'll defer the VAT payment again. I said, no, 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 just pay it, pay it, pay it. I don't want it hanging over, just pay it, you know. Mm. You're paying like giving yeah. 10 grand to the tax man. Yeah, you know, I walk into the bank today, you know, I walk into I walked into Barclays Bank today and I needed, you know, I've just bought a new lorry, you know, another lorry, and I, w- I walked into Barclays today and I said, I need three months of pay. Oh, hello, Mr. Bishop, or whatever. In the past, I walked into a bank. <laughs> and I fucking in the joint, cover. yeah. I walk in there, they call me. Do you ever Mr. see Bishop. when you walk into a bank now? Do you do you still get? Do you ever get excited? Do you ever still case the joint? Look at cameras. Never. Look at never. It's different rules now. You know, it's you're gonna get caught. Yeah. No one can do mm-hmm. robberies now without getting caught. There's AMPR cameras everywhere. The the the, the technology. It's just fucking now. grasses everywhere though. Grasses as well. everywhere. And what's been the game changer is the pocker. I don't know if you know what POCA is. No. It's, the, it's called the Proceeds of Crime Act. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now they can just basically take everything come off, and take yeah. everything off. Yeah. You, you know, and that's that's the game changer. I mean, mm-hmm. why, you know, you can go out and earn fucking millions of pounds doing whatever and they'll come and fucking take a lot yeah. one day. Do you think, though, then, that all come, stems down to the younger generation to be educated more? Because I always say it as well, even, the, even your entrepreneurial skills from drug dealers, they've got those skills oh, to be definitely. selling something else. It's just, it's all they know. It's a product they've got 
and they're building a network. Most definitely. But I think a lot of the youngsters today are being failed miserably by, not society, they're being failed Schooling. miserably by the, well, the ruling fucking elite, mm -hmm. you know. Have a look at, I mean, we were talking about it earlier, the property prices in London and all that, it's fucking unobtainable for these youngsters. They yeah. can't afford to leave home. They, you know, they, they can't go and get... You know, a lot of them do, I know. But, you know, if you ain't got a bank of mum and dad and all that there, the, the, we've learned no fucking lessons. When I was a kid, we got into crime, not because we were bad people, we got into crime because there was not a lot of options for to us. Survive. And, and we were impoverished. I'd be lying if I, says, mm -hmm. if I said we weren't impoverished. And there was no racism or anything like that where I grew up. You know, I, some of my best friends were... Black, we was all we was all in the, you know, we were all fucking scumbags as far as <laughs> as far as everyone else was concerned. We were equally as yeah. fucking scummy, but yeah, it's it, nowadays it's, it, you know, I really feel sorry for a lot of the youngsters, but I'm not making excuses for them. A lot of them are little fucking savages running around with knives and everything like that. They're all gangsters, and it's all something to be proud of and whatever. Yeah. And it ain't. Mm -hmm. But they don't know no fucking different. Because yeah, you've been there yourself, you know I've what it's been like. There. It's sad. It's tragic. Yeah. What was it like then? Coming out, were you scared coming out or did you oh, think, I've fully changed, I'm going to give it a go? No, no, but you no, probably no. says that every time you've come out. No, it's, it, 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 I knew it was going to be hard. I knew it was going to be hard when I come out. Did you have a plan or anything? Well, like the great John Lennon once said, life is something that happens when you're busy making other plans, mm -hmm. you know. I came out and I had all these wonderful plans and I met a, I met a bird and it all went fucking wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, Those are I met a woman, it all went fucking uh -huh. wrong. My plans went out the window in a short period of time. But mm -hmm. even though I did have a, a couple of hiccups along the way, my mate explains it beautifully. You know, I, I like to say I came out of Grendon, I've done fantastic, I've done well. No, I actually fucking, in the time I came out, I actually ended up getting nicked for another two arm robberies, another firearm charge where very lucky I wasn't <laughs> lifed off. After Grendon? After Grendon. After you thought you'd, but, <laughs> you'd changed and... Let me save myself here. Yeah, okay. What actually happened is, is I had a bit of a breakdown and it was because I was, I was suffering from something called bipolar and I never knew anything about men. Mm -hmm. I'd always suffer from depression. As a kid, I used to get anxiety attacks and things like that. I was diagnosed with being bipolar and I went a bit off my head and uh, I went on this stupid, mad robbery spree for like three days got about f six or seven grand or something at the time that that was what the sum total of these robberies come to i had more than that in the fucking bank and even the judge could see this was it was clear insanity yeah. and uh I was very lucky, so after I came out of Grendon, I got a, what's called an EPP sentence. I got a five EPP, which is, at the end of that five year, I had a extended public protection, where I was a MAPA, which is multi-agency public protection, all that rubbish. And uh, I had to uh, have all these stringent conditions on me when I got out to make sure I wasn't a threat and whatever. But that was the breaking point. When I went back away after having the experience of Grendon and having a little experience of freedom and going back away again, ending up in Wormwood Scrubs, Peterborough, being moved around the system again because of your record procedure and whatever. But then going, you know what? It kicked in. All what I'd learned in Grendon kicked in. And I've been out of jail now for over five years. Yeah, congratulations. And in the five years I've been out, I've wrote my autobiography. I started my scaffold company. I've stayed drug-free, most importantly, crime-free. You know, I choose my company wisely. I give back to society. You know, I give talks. I go to schools, universities. Um, I've been in a grammar school recently. I attend recovery meetings or whatever else. My life has gone full circle. It's almost like I don't recognise the man I once was. But I don't... We were talking about this well, when we... I don't take that for granted, you know. I, I have to take action every day because the yeah. demons are always there. But for today, they're in check, you know? Yeah, today's a good day. And that's, yeah. listen, that's the beauty of life. The fact that <clears throat> you've been through fucking hell. You've yeah. caused hell. Yeah. But it all stems again from being bullied, then trying to make a name for yourself, getting power, trying yeah. to get a bit of money, and then the drug abuse. We're searching for all the stuff externally. And the fact yeah. that you went through Grendon. See, when you came out after your three years in Grendon, after your big sentence, mm. did you go back on the drugs again? 
I, I did after a period, I had a relapse. That was like a precursor, but I think the mental health stuff happened before I picked up. Something was not right. And what happened is I was actually doing quite well when I came out. Financially, I was doing okay. Uh, I was in scaffolding. I was doing quite well. And um, I started to go a little bit off key, a little bit. Something weren't right. And I always knew something weren't right, but no one ever... Identified that? No, no one ever picked up on it. And, and, and it was only during that last sentence that I'd done that when I was assessed again by home office psychiatrist again before because mm. initially what happened when I was arrested for the firearms offences and whatever and like I said to you I was downstairs in that flat I'd actually took someone hostage one of my mates for some unknown reason I was out of me nut I took him hostage armed police stormed the flat to get him out and they were going to shoot me they told me that afterwards but because of the nature of that crime Again, I had to be assessed by psychiatrists to see if I was even fit to plead at the trial mm -hmm. uh, when I was arrested. Because they, they was how did you not get leave? Because the psychiatrist saved me. Psychiatric report saved me after I'd been arrested for that because they said I was suffering from a condition called bipolar, mm -hmm. which which I now I take medication for every night. I take uh, a, a tablet. It just keeps me. Stops Balanced. me going too high or too low. too low. It just keeps me sort of there. Yeah, I had a lot of uh, counselling when I was doing that sentence. When I was doing that, the, the five EPP, a um, lot of therapy, and above all, stayed drug free myself. Because if you if you're prone to anything mental, anything like that, which everyone is, you know, I talk about mental illness openly because every single person on this planet will suffer it at one point in their life, albeit just a bit of mild depression or whatever. But uh, if you take substances and things and you're a little bit nuts already, you know, it, it ain't fucking rocket nah. science, is it? Do you know it what I mean? Sends you over the edge. Thick plus thick equals thick, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> so <laughs> you went through all that then and then you, you, you've made a great transition the last yeah. five years to make the yeah. changes, get a business running. Yeah. How are you feeling then now? Do you still have negative thoughts you still have moments you know what? I feel I feel like a new man I feel like a new man my great you know financially I'm okay I've got my own my business and whatever else and uh, I've got some good friends in my life people who care about me and people I care about I'm with a lovely woman I've got my two little shih tzu dogs that mean the world mm -hmm. to me I've got my children in my life I've got a stepdaughter who's who's an absolute angel I love her to bits um, so I've got the family life the stability you know and my partner's Worse than any prison officer. You know, <laughs> when there's bang up in my ass, it's yeah. bang up. You know mm. what I mean? Like, yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's like being in a high security prison sometimes. Mm. We go, we go with. Yeah. Well, she's lovely. I love her to bits. But I've got that stability, that home life. The, the Nelson Mandela said it, didn't he? The greatest things in life may not always be free, but the greatest things in life are being free. Mm -hmm. You know, and and for me that is so true. You know, I'm free today. I'd rather be if I lost everything tomorrow. As long as I'm clean, as long as I'm out here, I've got a chance. In there, I've got no chance. And for me, the stakes are very high, very real. I'm not the sort of fella that goes out and goes, oh, and goes and gets arrested and gets three months or six weeks and then comes out, yeah, I'll be his bag, his mm. gangster. And I, I get nicked, it's very real. I'm going away for a long fucking period of time. Probably a lot of it's going to be in segregations or next time. They'll nut me off. They'll send me yeah. to one of the places where I won't get out. Because you're at the end of the yeah. road, what more can I do with you? Do you have anyone in contact with like social workers? You still don't license never, or anything? Never. I'm a free man. For the mm -hmm. first time, uh, two years ago, I was released finally by the uh, English probation system or whatever else. First time for over 30 years, I never had, I never had no, no, Nothing hanging no over chains, your no constraints, no bit of elastic, no nothing. I'm even allowed to have a British passport again. I was banned from having one for 10 years. Have you, when was the last time you went on holiday? Oh, fucking hell. I went to the Isle of Wight last year. That was nice. Was that, <laughs> was that the first time you've been away? Well, yeah. I, I mean, I've, probably, I've been the length and breadth of the country, but only in jail. Yeah. I've seen it all on a sweat box. Yeah. But uh, I, I'm going to take my... You know, the reality of it is I can afford to go mm -hmm. anywhere I want today. You know, I'm not being flashed, but I can afford to go yeah. to a beautiful island paradise tomorrow mm -hmm. and all I've got to do is get my passport mm -hmm. now I've been allowed to have it for over uh, two about two and a half years mm -hmm. now I've been allowed to have a passport and uh, I still ain't fucking applied for it does yet. it scare you to maybe go away again yeah 100%. checks it fucking 
airport oh, and you're well. going to get and fucking I've said red flag. Partner, You'll break the computer, man, once uh, you fucking scan your passport. I, I, I've said that to her. I've said that when we go through customs, expect to pull. They will pull me oh, in yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll be red flagged, man. 100%. Yeah. They'll pull me straight away. They'll mm-hmm. search any vehicle I'm in. They'll search me, what is the nature of your business, where you're going, mm-hmm. all of that. When I apply for a passport, I'm probably going to have... Uh, you know, the restrictions. Pub, I, I might even have to go and have an interview and all that. And the reason why is because uh, the the nature of the offences. Yeah. And it, because it's you when you back then I was smuggling people into the country and and that, I mean that's a terrible crime, a bad crime. But only I I got involved in it like through the back door. I wasn't supposed to actually be smuggling people. It was mm-hmm. supposed to be drugs. Where Do you I'm think not you get set up for right. that? I know I walked into somebody else's observation and yeah. on the on, I think it was the, the, the people that they were working with on the continent. Yeah. And the reason I know is because I actually met them at a service station at a different part of France. You know, I never made any statement. I made no statement. No one ever got arrested with me. I was done for being the ringleader. They knew I weren't. But when it came mm. into um, court initially, I was going to plead not guilty and plead mm. duress, say I was forced to do it or whatever drug debt the usual everyone knew everyone would that have been knew. a lesser sentence in, in France oh yeah I'd probably got three years in France yeah yeah. but what happened is uh, uh, I heard about this service station in a, in one of the customs reports and then what they'd done is they'd done something called PII which is public immunity whatever with all their covert surveillance they refused to re- reveal their covert surveillance to my solicitor and the only reason they could refuse to reveal their covert surveillance, obviously there was mm-hmm. vital intel in there that we're not allowed to see. Grass, perhaps I would say more likely, and it goes on all the time, that the actual crime was instigated in some way by infiltration by either police, customs, Interpol, MI5, NCIS, one of these one of these organisations, they actually infiltrate these gangs and play pivotal roles in the gang. Mm-hmm to bring down the whole gang you yeah. know what I mean it's yeah. like you see on the films this yeah. goes on police yeah. inst- uh, not police they, these shady world and whatever they mm-hmm. inst- when the crime's a bit organised that's what happens yeah. it's all fucking you know. corrupt isn't it 100% it's all corrupt 100%. so plans for the future then Ray you're well, doing well you're a free man you I, can get your passport you know, I've got I mean I review a lot of books like you know I've just reviewed Terry's which is fantastic I reviewed uh, Linda Calvey's A Black Widow mm-hmm. you know what a lovely woman mm-hmm. you know Mel's a good friend of mine Linda's book fantastic uh, I'll raise a set to give his book a plug he's got a dirty yeah, dozen yeah when's his book coming out well he's got a dirty dozen coming out in August uh, for John Blake Publishing yeah, so that's one Oh, it'd be the most. We'll leave the link on this podcast um, for description for No Razor Smith. Great man, he's brought on the podcast. Do you know oh, what? It, Ray, Razor's, a, for me, he's the best true crime all throughout there. Yeah. This, this one, the Dirty Dozens. If you want yeah. to know about armed robbery and the mm-hmm. making of armed mm-hmm. robbery, that's the one. But and then I've got um, my own book coming out soon, hopefully, called Smuggler's Roulette. I'll get you back on, we'll talk about That'd that. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, I'd be definitely. Really grateful. Yeah, a million percent. But Smuggler's Roulette, yeah. it's about my three years in the smuggling. But I always mm. knew, when I wrote Outlaw, I always knew I would have to dedicate a whole book to yeah. it because there was so much that happened mm. and so many tales and funny stories. And I didn't want to... I, when I wrote this book, I wanted it to really carry a message to youngsters and I was trying to deter them. There's nothing yeah. glamorous about crime yeah. and whatever. And, and, and I felt in some sense I owed to the victims of my own actions and whatever, to give them an understanding of why people do what they do mm-hmm. and whatever. And it's never okay to make a victim. Yeah, million percent, never. man, but you've got never. to live with that stuff. But again, you've got to understand that we are human. We do make mistakes. Some crimes are more hard hitting than others. But yeah. again, the beauty of life, brother, people can change. Your prime example, well, no razor Smith, prime example, yeah. Terry Ellis, Billy Moore. Well, I've made a commitment to myself. I fucked up the first half of my life. Yeah. And I'm going to do my damn best to try and make a go. Yeah, second like half. I say, you write books, mate. You've got the pen to write your life. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it's not finished yet. Yeah. The, you know? the best years of your life are always ahead of you. I always say that to people. People need to believe that you are the creator of your destiny. Most always definitely. say it. You can change. Anyone, one thing I will always say is anyone out there who's suffering from any mental health issues, any drug addiction, anything like that. Anyone out who thinks crime, anything like that, who thinks there's no way out or whatever, never give up hope and tap into the 
professional services or whatever else, whatever offers out there, tap into it. Because when I was young, I didn't even know it fucking existed. Maybe if someone had grabbed me at a young age and said, look, come and talk about things, well, maybe my life would have been different. Mm-hmm. You know, A poor girl the other day where I live, 18 years old, she jumped in front of a train. Oh, that's heartbreaking. Yeah, heartbreaking. Sad. And it's, when I hear things like that today, it tears me up inside, you know. I think, you know, get someone, talk to someone, don't suffer. Yeah, that's the, the best thing to do, whether it's a friend, the neighbour, the postman. If you anyone. talk to someone, man, releasing that anyone. stress or pressure. Talk to your dog, are Yeah, you talk know? to the fucking dog ceiling. understands yeah. me, it's yeah, the only yeah, one that yeah. does. Yeah. <laughs> well, then, here was, before we finish up, we must talk about your boxing as well. Yeah. Street fights, was it street fights? Or well, what, what happened, was it? I mean, I, don't, you know, I had the boxing career, didn't I? When I came out of prison initially, I went back into my boxing and uh, I was an unlicensed fighter. You know, I was never going to get my pro license because of my criminal record. The, 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 the boxing world is... You know, there's some fantastic ambassadors for the sport, but it's very pompous, the, the, the governing bodies. For me, I could, I was at that semi-pro sort of level. I'd probably been good enough to be a journeyman pro. I'm not going to say I'd been, I don't mean, as good as some of the greats out there, but I was I was game and I could have a row. And, and, I, and I boxed for an organisation and I took it as far as I could. And um, they had their own version of a British title and I won that British title, you know, that was a sense of achievement because I was 35 years old at the time and, and they said, uh, oh, you're yeah, too old, you won't do it, whatever else. And the reality of it is I won most of my fights, you know what I mean? I was quite mm-hmm. a good fighter and, and I'd done a lot of good training kids and we had our own little boxing camp and camaraderie, yeah. So I've been down that road and had earned my stripes there you still well. train? I still train now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just getting back into training and hopefully doing a bit of coaching as a little yeah. pastime, and mm-hmm. then the lockdown happened. But um, I've built a big scaffolding in my garden and yeah. put a punch bag on it and all mm-hmm. that. So keep active. Yeah, yeah good brother. Yeah. Ray, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure, brother. Thank Honestly, you, I thoroughly enjoyed your story. You know, Terry, your stories are phenomenal. I love Thank the you. fact that what you've been through and the fact that you've changed, mate. So I take my hat off to you. Thank you, James. Um, no, I really thank you. Um, thank you. You're a good guy, mate. Stay strong, brother. Stay in the path and keep fighting. Thank you.